بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر پارٹیسپنٹس ویلکم ٹو دس سیشن آف دا ٹیکسٹل اسٹڈی آف دا قرآن ان آر لاسٹ سیشن وی ہیڈ بگان دا تھرڈ سیکشن آف سورہ بکرا وچ از ان فیکٹ وی کین آلسو کال دا سیکنڈ سیکشن بیکاز دا فرسٹ از ایکچولی دی انٹروڈکشن اینڈ دا سورہ بگنس آفٹر دیٹ انٹروڈکشن فرام ورس فورٹی سو فرام ورس فورٹی ٹو ون ٹوینٹی ون فارم دا فرسٹ سیکشن اینڈ ان دس سیکشن وی فائن دیٹ دی جوز and the people of the book, uh, their charge sheet uh, against them was narrated to them. And uh, we've repeatedly found that in this uh, section, which was the previous section, it was discussed at how they thought that they were following the religion of Abraham and that it was uh, this religion uh, that had made them think that they were chosen people of God. And now in this section, which began last week with verse 122, It is being told that, well, this is what the religion of Abraham is and this is entirely different from what you are preaching. Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian. He was a devoted Muslim. He was a devoted person who submitted himself to God. So we had started off uh, with uh, this second section uh, from verse 122 and we had finished until verse 129. So we're going to continue with that. Uh, with this section of verses and start off now. So the next part is وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِلَّا مَنْ صَفِحَ نَفْسَ وَلَقَدِ اسْتَفَيْنَاهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And who is it that can deviate from the religion of Abraham? Indeed only he who takes to foolishness. We had chosen for him ourselves in this world. Uh, we had chosen him for ourselves in this world and in the world to come. He shall be among the righteous. The same Abraham that when his Lord directed him, submit, he answered without delay, I have submitted to the Lord of the universe. So uh, these verses, I can, as you can see, they clearly show how uh, submissive and uh, docile Abra- Abraham was for, at the call of his, uh, his Lord. And a very important and a very affectionate sentence that you can find here uh, with, uh, regarding Abraham uh, are these words, وَلَقَدْ اسْتَفَيْنَاهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرِيَا That we had chosen him for ourselves, uh, referring to the fact that he was chosen for the purpose of uh, furthering the message of uh, the Almighty and he was deputed for this. And as it is said that not only in this world he was a person who was chosen Uh, from for, uh, by the Almighty for himself to deliver his message. In the hereafter also he will be among the righteous. And therefore if this is the case, then who can be more foolish uh, than to deviate from Abraham's religion? So again the slant is towards the Jews that if, if this is what the truth is, then you have to follow what Abraham taught uh, without any deviation, without any additional alteration. And one of the most important traits which is mentioned here as, as a trait of Abraham is that, uh, as it is said, is قَالَ اللَّهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ And his Lord said to him that submit to me. And this specially uh, goes to the, uh, or takes our mind, in fact, it transports our mind to what had happened uh, in the incident of sacrifice when the Almighty, of course, wanted Abraham to submit to his uh, command and uh, we have already discussed this last time that it was primarily to devote his son uh, for the service of the house of God and he was shown a dream in which he saw that he was slaughtering his son. The interpretation of this dream as per ancient scriptures was that he was to devote him. I mean he was slaughtering him meaning that he was severing him from all worldly chores and errands and he was dedicating him for the cause of God. So it is here that he was said Uh, he was asked that you must submit to God and he showed that submission in a, in a, in a, in a mighty way, in, in a way which really inspires us. And then uh, the next part says, وَوَصَّى بِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بَنِيهِ وَيَعْقُوبُ يَا بَنِيَّا إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَى لَكُمُ الدِّينَ فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّا إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ And Abraham urged his sons to adopt this very religion and so did Jacob. He had said, My children, God has chosen for you this religion. Thus, you have to remain Muslims in all circumstances until you die. So, فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّا إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ So, you can see how clearly it is being said 
that you are chosen not as Jews or Christians, of course, they were to come much after uh, Abraham. Uh, they were chosen as Muslims. This word is repeatedly mentioned here, although it's not used as a term. Uh, it's used in its literal meaning, which means to submit to God. But nevertheless, we know that how important this is in this regard, that Abraham actually urged his sons to adopt uh, uh, this very religion. And it is said that Jacob or Yaqub uh, was no different in this regard. So Jacob, as we know, was his grandson. He was the son of Isaac. And from Jacob, we know this whole, uh, whole progeny that resulted, that ensued, was called the Israelites and the, uh, the Laqab or the, 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 the special name given to Jacob was Israel. So therefore, all his progeny are called the Banu Israel or as we, as we call them, the Banu Israel. So this is how the Quran has said that not only Abraham, but Jacob also he had said or he had advised or he had counseled his children to exactly the same uh, what Abraham had done, that you remain, you have to remain Muslim. It says, فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ In all circumstances, you have to submit, you have to remain Muslims. So, uh, this, these words of counsel of uh, Prophet Jacob are reported in the Talmud as well, uh, as we know, but there is no mention of these words of counsel uh, for Abraham in these Jewish scriptures. We know that uh, for Jacob, this was something that had been done. But for Abraham, we don't find these words. However, the Quran has made it clear that these words were originally from Abraham and were adhered to by Jacob as well. And Jacob is actually mentioned here with Abraham because the Israelites were the progeny of Jacob, as I have just said. And here the intention is to inform the Israelites that their forefathers were the followers of Islam and they had never asked their progeny, progeny to follow Judaism or Christianity. So it is so... I mean, pinpointedly made it clear repeatedly to the Israelites that look here, your progenitor, your forefather, the one to revere was Abraham and he never was uh, either, neither a Jew or, or a Christian. He was a Muslim and this is what he had asked his children to adhere to and he had asked them to follow that in all circumstances you have to remain Muslims and you have to die as Muslims as well. And then it is stated, Am kuntum shuhada is hadara ya'qub al maut is qala li banihi ma ta'buduna min ba'di qalu na'budu ilahaka wa ilaha abaika Ibrahima wa Ismaila wa Ishaqa ilahan wahid wa nahnu lahu muslimun tilka ummatun kad khalat laha ma kasabat wa lakum ma kasabtum wa la tus'aluna amma kanu ya'malun then were you present, then were you people present when Jacob was about to die? At that time, when he asked his sons, who will worship after me? Who will you worship after me? They replied, we will worship only that one God who is your God, the God of your forefathers, Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac, and to him we submit. This was a community which passed away. Theirs is what they did and yours is what you did. And and was not you will be and what you did was will not be questioned about it uh, regarding the others. Uh, there has been some misprint in the translation here. So the exact translation would be, aluna amma kanu yamalun, and you will not be asked about what they have done, and they will be not. I mean, exactly, it would, it would mean that wala aluna amma kanu yamalun, and you will not be questioned or you will not be asked of what they do. So as you can see that once again it is made clear. Previously it was uh, it was said that Ya Bani Ya Inna Allah Hastafa Adama. These were the words which were said by Abraham and by Jacob. And once again it is said that were you present when Jacob was about to die? Did he uh, did he will or did he advise his uh, progeny to adhere to someone else but to the religion of Abraham? Is that so? No, this is not so. Because when he was dying, he said to his children, and what did he say? I mean, this is a question that he had asked, that who would you worship after me? Now, this has a very important ring in it, because Jacob uh, on his deathbed was now, uh, he was actually fully cognizant of the fact that a, a full nation is going to rise from his progeny. They are the Israelites. And the biggest thing, for the Israelites is that they must remain on the path of monotheism, on the path which 
their forefather Abraham had left them on. And that is why they have repeatedly asked this question to them. And when this question was asked to them that who would you worship after me? The reply was that we will worship whomever your own father and your forefather worshipped. Your, your father Isaac and his brother Ishmael and the father of both these who is Abraham. We will worship him and we will submit. And then it is emphatically stated that remember this is a community who has now passed away. And whatever they did was their own. They will be questioned about it. You will not be questioned about what they did. Yes, this does mean that every person is accountable for what he does and no one else is accountable. So therefore, the Israelites are also being told that remember this is something which has now passed and if you have to follow your own, uh, your own forefathers then you have to absolutely rely on what Abraham had left for you. And then وَقَالُوا كُونُوا هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارَى تَحْتَدُوا قُلْ بَلْ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ قُولُوا آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَالْأَسْبَاتِ وَمَا أُوْتِيَ مُوسَى وَإِيسَى وَمَا أُوْتِيَ النَّبِيُّونَ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ this is the tradition of their forefathers and contrary to this they insist only if you become a Jew or a Christian that you will be guided. Tell them adopt in fact the religion of Abraham who was fully inclined to his Lord among a Lord among the idolaters. So this is uh, something which is said that he was fully inclined and he was not among the idolaters. Believers tell them, believers tell them, we have believed in God and that which has, has been revealed to us and that which was revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob and their children and that which was given to Moses and Jesus and to all the prophets by their Lord. We do not discriminate between anyone among them. All of them are messengers of God and to him alone we submit. So this is such a uh, emphatic way in introducing the whole concept once again before the Israelites and it is said later on uh, from, the, from the tongue of the believers that well no one except the, our, own, our, our own prophets of God do we believe and we do not differentiate between them. We don't make any distinction between them. So you see that earlier on we can see that how, uh, how emphatically and how uh, in, a, in a way that they would not tolerate any difference of opinion, Jews of, and Christians would, would stress upon their followers that until you become a Jew, you will not succeed, you will not uh, attain salvation. And the Christians were no different. And this is a, this is a theme which is repeated uh, a number of times in the last section. And once this section was over and we have started the second section of the surah, you will find how often this is negated. And it is said that, remember, Abraham never told you to be a Jew or a Christian. He was a Hanifa Muslim. He was not among the Mushrikun. He was not, he did not have the same beliefs as you are having. And you are repeatedly ascribing your beliefs to him. And his beliefs were not what you are ascribing him. They are, but they were totally different. And if they are different, then how can you impute a lie to Abraham? This is basically lying and imputing someone, uh, something to him that he never said. And when it is, when matters have reached this particular uh, intent, I would say, or this extent, how uh, how closely the Quran is watching the uh, its own followers, and how people who follow the Quran themselves need to react and act. So it is said that from your own tongue you disown this statement of the Jews and Christians, and when you say this. You have to say it in an emphatic way that we believe in all the prophets of God, starting from Abraham right uh, to the last prophet who was Jesus. And it is said, I mean the last prophet of the Israelites. And it is said that we will not distinguish between any of these prophets. We will not uh, hold any one of them to be superior to the other. This is what we have been taught. And therefore, لا نفرق بين أحد منهم ونحن له مسلمون We shall not differentiate, we shall not discriminate between any of these prophets of God. We will hold them in equal esteem and 
as far as submission is concerned, as far as acceptance is concerned, we shall only submit to the Almighty. Next, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدِ اِهْتَدَوْا وَإِنْ تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّمَا هُمْ فِي شِقَاقِ فَسَيَكْفِيكَهُمُ اللَّهُ هُوَ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Then if they accept the way you have, they will be rightly guided. And what does this mean? It means that the way you have accepted by saying that we believe in all prophets of God and we do not distinguish between them, we do not discriminate between them. So it is said that if these people also, these Israelites also accept the way you have accepted without making any distinction, then it is, it is said, فَكَذِهْتَدَوْ Then they shall be guided. وَإِن تَوَلَّوْ فَإِنَّمَا هُمْ فِي شِخَاقِ And if they turn away, then they alone are the obstinate. So against them, God is sufficient for you, O Prophet, and He hears all and is aware of everything. سِبْغَةَ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ سِبْغَةً وَنَحْنُ لَهُ عَابِدُونَ قُلْ أَتُحَاجُّونَنَا فِي اللَّهِ وَهُوَ رَبُّنَا وَرَبُّكُمْ وَلَنَا أَعْمَالُنَا وَلَكُمْ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُخْلِسُونَ Tell them, adopt this color of God, and whose color is better than God's, and say we worship Him only in all circumstances. So once again the reference is that this color of God in which you shall not distinguish between any prophets of God. All prophets of God, they hold equal respect. They must not be differentiated. They, none of them should be regarded as superior or inferior. And at another place, as we shall go along in Surah Baqarah, it is said that, Tilka Rusulu faddalna ba'dahum ala ba'd. That yes, there are instances in which we have given some messengers uh, superiority over others. But this is not absolute. This superiority is relative. For example, it is said, Kallamullahu Musa taklima, that the Almighty spoke with, with Moses. And this is something which is uh, specific to Moses. No, uh, no one else had this uh, fortune of uh, being spoken to by God. And regarding Jesus, it is said, وَأَيَّدَنَاهُ بِرُوحِ الْخُدُسِ That he was specially helped by the Holy Spirit. So these are all relative superiorities, or you can say that these are distinctions. In, in, in particular, these distinctions relate to the, to the era in which each prophet of God was born. So we know that the nature of miracles which was given to each prophet or to each messenger actually match the time and era in which that miracle was needed. For example, we know that the people uh, of uh, the Pharaoh and the Israel, I mean, the, uh, they, were, they were such that unless and until they were shown uh, a miracle of, uh, I mean, some, something that would have startled them, they would not have believed in God. So we know the type of miracle that was given to, uh, to Moses, for example, was the serpent and the stick. And of course, we know there were other miracles as well given to him. The Quran just speaks of two. Uh, it refers to his white hand, it refers to his staff turning into a serpent, but the rest of them are found in the Bible. Similarly, if you look at uh, Jesus, the nature of miracles that were given to him, they were, I mean, they were mind-boggling, they were as if, uh, uh, I mean, some things which only he could have done and he is supposed to have done. For example, he was able to cure the dead, I mean, he was, he was able to bring back the dead from life, which is a singular, uh, I mean, singular miracle, no other prophet was given this miracle. And once again, you see that the nature of this miracle is commensurate with the era in which he was living. And this was a prophet of God, a mighty prophet of God, who was to be the last messenger amongst the Israelites. And in 2,000 years or two and a half thousand years, they had not woken up from their slumber. And this was like a last minute jolt and shake that they received at the hands of Jesus when, uh, I mean, you could not have imagined it a dead person being restored to life. But this is what he did in order to open their eyes. But even then they did not open their eyes. And if you look at Prophet Muhammad's era, you will, you will know that the Arabs, they were very, very proficient in, uh, in oration, in poetry, in literary pursuits. So the nature of miracle which was given to Prophet Muhammad was in fact the Quran, which of course we know is a miracle of, of uh, literary status. It is something which is of, uh, it, which inspires our, uh, our eyes, our hearts, our minds uh, to the level that we all are aware of. So because of the fact that the Arabs were, were superbly literary, we have uh, a lot of, they had a lot of rich history in this regard. So the nature of miracle or the nature 
uh, of, uh, some, of something of a bayyana which the Quran calls it was given to him was the Quran itself so that they are astounded and they are bewildered by its majesty. So the basic thing here which the Quran is telling us that Sibhat Allah, you must adopt the color of God and that color of God is monotheism and that color of God is the fact that you will not differentiate between any of its prophets. And of course, this is another sentence which is rather, uh, I mean, it's like a rebuke being sounded to them that it says, Do you dispute with us about God? Whereas he alone is our Lord and your Lord. And, the, and, and if this is not so, then to us our deeds and to you yours. So remember, if God is someone that you think he is more kind to you and he, you, I mean, he has chosen you and, he's, and therefore you are elevated to a certain pedestal and we no longer have uh, the favor of God, then you are sadly mistaken. You, you have not been chosen because you are superior. You have been chosen for a particular responsibility. And for that responsibility, if you shirk that responsibility, then remember God's law is unbiased. It is unrelenting and it will depose you from this position, from this position of authority, from this position of shahada, from this position of conveying the truth to the rest of the world. And then it is said, in a very, very uh, emphatic way once again, that to, to us what we do and to you what you do, and to him we are purely devoted. Am taquluna inna Ibrahima wa Ismaila wa Ishaqa wa Yaquba wal Asbat kanu hudan aw nasara kul a antum a'lamu amillah wa man azlamu mimman katama shahadatan indahu min Allah wa mallahu bighafilin amma ta'malun tilka ummatun kad khalat laha ma kasabat wa lakum ma kasabatum وَلَا تُسْأَلُونَ عَمَّا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Do you claim Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob and their children were Jews or Christians? Ask them, do you know more or God? Alas, who can be more unjust than those who have a testimony from God and they conceal it? And in reality, God is not unaware of what you are doing. This was a community which passed away. Theirs is what they did, and yours what you did. You shall not be questioned about what they used to do. So you can see that this verse is actually repeated uh, uh, some verses before as well, once again giving uh, this very strong uh, message from the Quran that everyone is responsible for his or her own, own deeds. No one is going to be questioned for what someone else did. And once again it is said that if Abraham or Ishmael or Isaac or their children or their progeny, uh, if you claim that they were Jews and Christians, then you are, I mean, not only mistaken, you are, you are actually uttering a blatant lie. Because, Kul antum do you know more or does God know more? I mean, this is something that you know very well that this never happened. And it, it was not that uh, Abraham or Ishmael, either of them were Jews or Christians. I mean, Judaism and Christianity was born I mean, centuries after them. How could you have claimed that these prophets were Jews or Christians? And when this is not so, then the Quran makes this very important charge against the Israelites. It says, now you are guilty of hiding God's testimony. And you, uh, and who can be more unjust than those who have a testimony from God and they conceal it. They know that this, whatever they are claiming is not true. The testimony that they have was that Abraham never, never indulged in such partisanship. He was not a Jew. He was not a Christian. He was a Hanifa Muslim. He submitted to God. And this is something that you very well know yourself and you are hiding this. This is a testimony that you are hiding. And remember that God is not unaware of what you do, what you're doing. And therefore, if what you have done now is going to be a, a made a stigma on your face, when you will rise on the day of judgment, you will know very well here that what you did was out of your own willful intention. It was not because of any confusion. It was not because of any doubt or any misinformation. It was your own doing that you did not want to accept uh, the fact that Abraham was not a Jew or a Christian. And one can really, uh, I mean, one really wonders, uh, dear viewers, at how audacious people become 
uh, when they start to distort history and when they start to distort facts that uh, I mean they distort it in such a manner that even blatant historical truths uh, they are challenged and how could have Abraham been a Jew or a Christian when Judaism and Christianity was not were not even born at his time I mean this is such a such a common sense question and in spite of this they were still insisting that Abraham was a Jew and the other faction was saying that he was a Christian. So you see this is uh, an important uh, aspect that we have to understand that as far as the Israelites are concerned, the Jews and Christians are concerned, they have been guilty of a number of blemishes and when we speak of uh, these blemishes and when we speak of God's wrath against them, that does match. <coughs> and it matches because you see what you have to know is that as far as this is concerned, uh, God's wrath, God's anger on these Jews and Christians is because of the fact that they were intentionally hiding a reality. They were fully cognizant of that reality and God's anger uh, does burn against them simply because they were doing it deliberately. And I would like to make this point once again so that it remains clear in your minds. We have discussed this before as well that you can clearly see that the way these Jews and Christians uh, have been dealt here by the Quran in such a in such a way that uh, they are receiving God's uh, rebuke every now and then. Uh, they are a special category. I mean, they are the ones to whom the truth had been unveiled. The Quran had spoken to them. Uh, prophets of God had spoken to them. They were the children of the prophets of God. For two and a half thousand years, prophets of God came to them one after the other, and they had left no stone unturned in disseminating the truth and this is something which in spite of all these efforts continued to happen and it happened for a long period of time and until the last of these Israelite prophets came to them who was Jesus who told them that this is the time that they have to wake up because once he goes away the prince of the world is coming that is what he said regarding prophet Muhammad the prince of the world is coming and he is going to stay with you until the day of judgment as uh, it is said in, in the Gospel of John. And if he's going to stay until the day of judgment then you better mend your ways because now it is as if everything, everything is, is going to end for them. But even then they did not realize. So the point that I'm making here is that you have to understand that the Jews and the Christians which the Quran speaks of in such harsh terms are the Jews and the Christians to whom uh, prophets of God have spoken and delivered the truth in an ultimate way and they cannot be held analogous to the Jews and Christians of today vis-a-vis -vis the delivery of the truth. Yes, uh, they are guilty of exactly the same blemishes uh, in most cases but remember uh, now once the prophets of God have passed away the Jews and Christians that live today, they do have, uh, they could have this alibi, they could have this excuse that today uh, the way Muslims are or believers are in fact communicating the truth to them is something which is actually taking them away from the truth itself. Uh, given how they are behaving, given how there are a number of, uh, I would say, barriers and hindrances in accepting the truth. So, uh, we have to understand that when the Quran speaks of uh, punishing the Jews and Christians especially it speaks of the Jews and the Christians of the times of Prophet Muhammad because they were guilty of, of knowing the truth. They knew the Prophet of God is the truth. So the Quran at one instance says ya kama ya that they recognize the Quran and this Prophet the way they recognize their own children. And how can a person be uh, not familiar with his own children. Such is the clear recognition but in spite of that they deny him. So we have to make this distinction that uh, as far as the Jews and Christians which, uh, which are being referred to here, uh, the charge sheet which is being handed down to them is uh, in, a, in a very different way uh, because this is something which prophets of God or messenger of God, uh, in fact the last messenger of God is communicating to them and any blemish in their part or on their part is not going to be left unpunished. So now uh, before we move on to uh, having a literal uh, idiomatic translation of the verses that we have studied, if there are, there are any questions regarding uh, the verses that we have studied today, please raise them. Thank you very much my teacher. Uh, we do have questions now. The first question seems to be from Imran. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum uh, Dr. Shazad uh, Thank you very much uh, for the explanation. Um, I have just a question about uh, the way the Quran has started a couple of ayahs. 
like am takuluna this uh, and am takuluna so i was just you know that's like if you are you know like normal conversation like the 133 mm. it's talking about am kuntum shahada id hadar hadar yaqub al maut and then 140 starts with am takuluna inna ibrahim wa ismail wa ishaq to like it's it's like as if there was one sentence it's either this or that or, or or if you can shed light on that maybe i'm reading it wrong thank you no actually the word um is not always used uh, in this sense that you say either this or that uh it's also used uh, as a as a question uh, as as you can see the way it has been translated uh, wherever it occurs for example when it occurs in uh, in verse 133 it says am kuntum shuhada uh, so were you present so am here is uh, is a particle of interrogation i would say so it's, it's an interrogative particle so am is not always used in the sense of au or or it's used also in this sense and there is also this element of rebuke which is found in it when whenever you whenever the uh, quran poses a question and then does not wait for an answer it actually means that there is no answer to such a question and therefore that is why it's it's said in in a such in such a very uh, i would say uh, it is stressed in a in a very very uh, uh, in a very emphatic way and uh, the word um as i said is is just used as, as a interrogative particle Ani Oneza, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Salam to Dr. Shahzad. I have a few Fine. questions here. Um, okay. When you talk about two one thirty two, as you have mentioned that you know in Abraham's time there was no mm-hmm. Judaism or Christianity, so why the question? And and I feel that you know so I feel that the intent is that. Um, Jews and Christians have no right to have an exclusivist claim on Abraham. Uh, at least, you know that's how I'm reading it. But that mm-hmm. does not mean that Muslims have an exclusivist claim on Abraham either. So, Correct. you know, when I, when I read this verse in the context of what we have read in Al Baqarah as yet, mm-hmm. the scheme that you know seems to emerge, and please correct me if you feel differently. is that you know we start with you know the book then we start with adam then we start with you know banu israel and now we are mm-hmm. going kind of chronologically taking a step back and going back to abraham and then we're saying that you know he wasn't a jew or a, or a christian you know and he was and then all of his sons uh, followed the religion uh, of mm-hmm. abraham and followed his right. god so it's kind of more of you know settling a uh, question of lineage that you know uh, yes all the previous prophets had come uh, in the lineage of um, israel but now it's ismail and it's really saying that you know uh, they they don't have an exclusive claim to ibrahim so now the ismailites have a claim to ibrahim as much as they do so it's not so much saying you know all the followers of judaism and christianity need to now become muslims it's just saying you know they have their covenant with god you have your covenant with god and you know this is kind of the announcement of the establishment of a new community or the and right after this we 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 read about you know the qibla passing from uh, uh the previous to you know the new one so it it's more of an announcement of a change in the lineage um of abraham's sons from mm-hmm. uh, the israelites to the ishmaelites uh, and not so much saying that you know muslims have an exclusive claim on abraham in, in in fact it's saying nobody has an exclusive claim on abraham yes correct i mean as far as uh, this claim is concerned no one has that claim but as far as belief in the last prophet is concerned i mean that is something Uh, i think i referred uh, to one of your previous questions as well some weeks ago uh, to one of the earlier verses in surah bakara uh, in fact it occurs in in the introduction it says aminu bima anzaltu musaddiqan lima ma bayna yadayhi which means that uh, oh you Jews and christians you have you believe in what has been revealed to me so the prof it is through the tongue of the prophet that they are being told that it you are you you are liable i mean you shall be held accountable if you don't believe on what has been revealed to me referring to the quran so exclusivist or non exclusivist this is another th- question but the fact is that uh, the guidance which was now enshrined in the form of the last guidance in the quran was something which they were liable to accept uh, i mean this is the this is what the, the surah at, actually started off with 
It then actually uh, branched into some of their own claims which they made and then they went back on those claims and amongst those claims were that uh, they were the chosen people of God and they had more right on Abraham and because they had more right on Abraham so therefore uh, they are teaching the, the religion of Abraham as well and when they would say so they would distort his teachings and they would end up saying that well uh, Abraham was a Jew and, and, those, uh, and the Christians would say that he, would, he was a Christian. So you see uh, you have to follow the flow of the surah in which basically they are being told that now that they were waiting for that last prophet, something that they were anxiously awaiting, something which the scriptures has spoken of, something uh, about which they had given a covenant with the Almighty that when that last prophet would come they would believe in him. Uh, and some of the other verses say, Azaruhu wa Nasaruhu, you would, they would respect him and then help him uh, in establishing uh, and, and furthering the cause of religion. So they are reminded of this time and again. And by reminding them, they are also told that, look, you were people who were given the same position and you repeatedly flouted uh, the promises that you made. And now one of the things that is hindering you is that the new prophet which is, has come, he's, he's I mean, you think that uh, uh, he has no stake on salvation because the stake toward that salvation is only held by those people who are either Jews or Christians. So I think what we need to understand here is that exclusivism is not being spoken of as much as the fact that this, these Jews and Christians are being told that uh, you, were, you had committed to the fact that this last prophet is going to come. And now that he has arrived, uh, 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 the Quran says La takunu avvala kafirin bihi. you should not be the first ones to deny him so the whole theme of Surah Baqarah basically is uh, against their, their I mean against what they had believed they had committed to God uh, in the form of earlier scriptures and when the time for the fulfillment of those promises came in various periods of time they flouted it and the biggest promise that they broke was regarding the arrival of the last prophet uh, which they were told to honor the institutionalized religion, right, Judaism, Christianity, Islam is one thing. And belief in the, you know, whatever Abraham believed in and his sons believed in is another thing. So it's it's more a call to Jews and Christians to say, you know, you should recognize your loss of station that, you know, the final prophet did not come in your, in the progeny of, um, you know, uh, Israel. But... Mm -hmm. You know, and you should recognize that, you know, this prophet who's, the, who's an Ismailite prophet, you know, is the final prophet. But that, right. in mean, but, but that by no means requires that community to convert to Islam. Because, you know, if you look at what Islam is, the book is the same and the rites and rituals are different, which is what follows, you know, through the rest of Baqarah. And, you know, if you look at Judaism and Christianity, the rites and rituals were different. So it's really the rites and rituals which are changing, which means that, you know, there can be a community and there is reference to such communities uh, elsewhere in, 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 in the book, which can recognize the prophet as the last prophet and still stay within their own community and be adherents of, you know, Abrahamic religion and get salvation. As an example, you know, we, we know that... Actually, uh, could I interrupt you here? As I said, that you see, uh, I mean, it's good to have uh, these thoughts and these uh, desires. Uh, I mean, uh, I could have gone with you. But the, the thing is that the Quran is pulling us in our, to another place. It, it is telling us through the mouth of the Prophet, Aminu bima anzaltu lima baina. You believe in this book which is being revealed to me, and you are liable to believe in this book. So you see, it's, it's not that they could remain on their own uh, I mean, beliefs as a separate community and still acknowledge him to be the last prophet and without uh, following him. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is a, a view held by many people, but I'm afraid. I mean, I, 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 I like this view very much. This, it has a lot of uh, tolerance and pluralism in it. But the fact is the Quran is repeatedly asking us through the tongue of the prophet, I mean, asking them, that uh, it is they who are being required. I mean, they are the people who are waiting for this prophet. I mean, it's not just the fact that they, they were waiting for him to form a separate community and they will congratulate him. They were waiting for this prophet to come so that they could profess belief in him. And, and once the prophet came, he said that, well, I have now come and now you are the people who are the first deniers in me. So you see, this central theme, you just cannot overlook it however much uh, we might like to. 
that the that the surah is replete with this this uh, uh, invitation from the mouth of the prophet that you have to believe in the last prophet and as far as the rituals are concerned and as far as some of the other things are concerned remember so uh, a lot of things were lost to posterity and the practices of the abrahamic religion and the previous scriptures they did not exist in their original form i mean they were all translations so i mean the fact that the quran was given to us as the final guidance as a guidance which was preserved in its original language and the practices also preserved this was an a common sense need of the, of, of the art because the previous communities as they themselves acknowledged they did not they were not uh, i mean they were not recipients of the original guidance they they were re- recipients of the remnants of the original guidance so take the example of you know the king of habsha was it najashi where let uh, i mean i mean say let me and once again interrupt you see if you go through history that is another line that you will tow you need to first you see answer the questions which the quran has raised i mean the quran says uh, addressing the jews and christians that you profess faith in the quran and this if you pick up uh, i think it's maybe the 36 verse of surah al-baqarah it says aminu bima anzaltu you profess faith in this quran that has been revealed to me and then it says la takunu awwala kafirin bihi the right right next to it so you see if you start approaching this whole paradigm i mean through the quran and then i mean let the quran uh, rule our uh, our our minds it will it is then that we are going to perhaps reach the truth otherwise if you start looking through history or how people behaved that is not the right approach that i would recommend but i'm you know this is the times of the prophet and so i'm kind of presenting this example so i can get your views on it so if you look at that you know i don't remember which country it was but uh a con- you know a group of muslims migrated from mecca to i think it was habsha or some other country where the christian king said you know i recognize what you're saying and what is in my scripture and he helped them so that's that to me is an example of you know i don't know you see this is a story which is narrated to us i mean this is a story it has no authenticity you see you need to weigh the quran you cannot weigh the quran with these stories and these uh, things that are circulating around us uh, you you need to check those sources once again but i am talking to you regarding the quran i mean you need to first answer how the quran is emphatically t- t- telling the jews and christians of his own times uh, of its own times so you see you just uh, have to understand this approach that one approach is to grab the quran and go along what it says however our desires might be different and another approach is you look upon look at history and sira and there are many other narratives and if i start quoting you some of my uh, readings that i have regarding uh, those times uh, it will be a whole mess of confusion that i can uh, really weave here so i think uh, this is the biggest contribution which the quran has made but i feel that you know in the quran you know it's kind of the questions you're asking of it because you know you're quoting uh 246 i think and then similarly when you go to 262 then a different view emerges when you go to 548 then a different view emerges so i don't think so i mean let these verses come we will uh, we will uh, i mean try to answer all these verses as they come but you see uh, my fundamental uh, take here is that until i mean the time that we have started these 132 verses or 140 verses uh, you will find repeated references already in surah bakara which asked the jews and christians that they have to profess faith in the last prophet of god it, they tell him they tell, they tell them that you should not be the deniers of this prophet of god how can you uh, next question is from noshat noshat please go ahead when you say that uh, abraham uh, uh, the, the jews didn't exist at the time of abraham that when did they actually come into existence you know we know about the christians that the christianity in the part when jesus uh, was um, uh, i mean this is uh, yes i know what you're asking you see this is a uh, i mean even the jews of their times uh, the quran says they were called muslims the, st- the the claim of the quran is that the that moses i mean whose followers later later came to be known as the jews uh, they themselves uh were called muslims by moses himself so this is what uh, what happened later on that the followers of moses started to be called the jews this never happened before him and we know there is a considerable period of time between abraham and moses almost 800 years and it was in his times that the israelites start uh, got started to be organized under his banner and they became a nation the way uh nations are 
So this happened much later. And uh, uh, until then, the Quran, the Quran says that these followers were called Muslims. I mean, the word was Muslim because in Surah Hajj, it says explicitly, who was some makumul muslimin, that the name given by Abraham to all his followers was Muslim. So presumably, the, the Quran is correcting their history and telling them that you have divided yourself into various uh, factions and names and titles, whereas your f forefather, your progenitor, Abraham, never did so. He called you Muslims. But if you ask me exactly when the, uh, when the Jews, I mean, they were recognized as Jews, it was well after Moses. Right, sir, and uh, just one small uh, uh, pointing, pointing out something. But in 132, when you say that the word Muslim is not used as a proper noun, but right. uh, as a general uh, uh, word for submission to Allah, then in, right. the, in the translation, it's with a capital M. I think there is so, to be with us. Yes, I mean, there, I mean, it is here that uh, uh, I mean you can find because this is something which I might I have translated. Uh, basically, it's the translation of Ustaz Javed Ahmed Ghamidi. He has used the word Muslim in his Urdu translation. So that is why uh, in the English we, we have stuck with the same word. But you see, uh, if I can make it more, a little more clear, if you pick up the last verses of Surah Hajj, uh, you'll find out that the issue of literal and non-literal has been resolved by the Quran because the words of the Quran are uh, by... I mean, referring to Abraham, the words are "Hua samakumul muslimin." He has named you as Muslims. So, I mean, there can be no difference here that it, whether it's being used literally or not. I mean, it's not used being not used being uh, it's not being used literally because the words are Abraham has named you as Muslims in the last uh, verses of Surah Hajj. So, we clearly know that that is why uh, he is, uh, Muslims are called Muslim because they submit. But not only this is something which has become their title, it's also something which has a, a very deep meaning attached to it. So the meaning and the title, they have become one uh, in this instance. But yes, in this case, as you can see, that the word Muslim is used uh, because of the fact that Ustaz has used the word Muslim in his Urdu translation. Many thanks, sir. Uh, next Thank question you. is from Riyas. Please go ahead. Now, in today's environment, uh, especially in the, uh, at interfaith meetings, we right. have a situation where Muslims say there is no Christianity or Judaism, only Islam exists. And then mm -hmm. that confuses the, the Jews and the Christians by saying, well, what do you mean? We don't call ourselves Muslims. And what is a Muslim? Mm -hmm. Or who is a Muslim? Uh, Muslims perceive Muslim as us, followers of uh, enough, uh, in other words, followers of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as, and the Christians and, of course, naturally the Jews have a different perception. How do we sort of manage the situation today? Hmm. I think, uh, as I've been telling this all along, that you have to introduce your non-Muslim friends, uh, especially the Jews and Christians, uh, to the Quran in its proper vein and its proper background. And how the Quran insists that the same religion was revealed to all prophets of God and all the followers of uh, these prophets were called Muslim uh, because it literally means to submit to God and uh, this submission became the title of all those who follow prophets of God. And uh, as far as uh, the versions of uh, the, the, the truth are concerned, they, they were I mean, given uh, earlier on. Uh, in various formats, uh, they were not preserved because the profit of institution of prophethood was not terminated and prophets of God used to come and therefore there was no need to preserve guidance in the presence of a prophet of God and ultimately that guidance was culminated uh, in the form of prophet Muhammad. So I think the question that you need to uh, put forth is, is rather a more basic question and that is that, uh, I mean, the, uh, the believers or the followers of the Quran say that they have God's guidance preserved in its original language in the form of the Quran. And this is a claim which is not made by the Jews and the Christians. Uh, none of their scholars make this claim that they have God's guidance in its original form. So uh, this is like telling them that we have, or at least, at least we claim that we have God's guidance in its original form. So what you need to do is judge whether we are, what we are claiming is true or not. So I think the basic thing that needs to be conveyed to them is the claim which is being made is that we have God's guidance in its final form 
and uh, this is what we say and as far as the guidance that you have in the form of the Torah or the Injil, they are yes God's guidance but they are not preserved in their original language as yet. But we, we make this claim that we have the Quran in its original language. So the thing that you are now to, uh, I mean, posed as a question or a challenge maybe is that uh, if you, I mean, negate that the Quran is not the word of God or the book of God and you think that this is, I mean, uh, you, I mean, anything that you can, any, any point that you can make up, for example, we know that the Christian church today holds this opinion that uh, Muhammad is a prophet of God, but he's only meant for Muslims. Uh, and they recognize the Quran as well, but they say that uh, it's just for the Muslims. So the fact is that they have to come up and negate this claim in some way or the other. So the claim is that this is the original guidance that we have uh, preserved. And if they think that this is not the original guidance, then they have to be, I mean, they have to make, they, ha they have to be satisfied in their own conscience and in their own mind that they are refuting this claim. So I think it's basically, it boils down to this, uh, this comparison of scriptures. Many thanks. Uh, next question is from Riyaz Khan. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sir. Wa alaikum as -salam. Uh, this ayah 138, it says, Woman ahsanu min Allah is And mm -hmm. the, some scholars, they say it refers to the, specifically to the Christians. Is it true? I mean, for example, they baptize. No. I mean, I mean, this is, this is, uh, I mean, reference to the fact that, yes, uh, the Christian, bap uh, the baptism which took, takes place is something similar. I mean, this is a slant that you can say. Uh, and I think, I do remember Ustaz Amiruddin Farahi and our uh, other Farahi scholars also saying that the word Sibra has been used specially uh, to have this insinuation towards the baptism. It could be so, uh, but I think here we have to understand that basically monotheism is being referred to and uh, it has been said that the color of God is that you just have to, uh, I mean, regard him to be a singular deity and that is how he has pre presented and projected himself. So you mean it, it refers to both Christians and Jews here, right? It's basically, yes, inviting them that the color of God is, is what the color of God is, and that is monotheism. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is from Akram Bhatti. Please go ahead, sir. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam. My question is that... Um, Allah Ta'ala, whenever he addresses, he addresses, Ya Yuhal Ajna, Ya Ya Yuhal Mu'minu, or Ya, okay, and, and uh, he never said, you know, Ya Yuhal Muslimu. Ibrahim Islam said in Surah Hajj and, uh, uh, and Surah Bakr, we reading that uh, uh, all of you will be, you know, die as a Muslim. Uh, and also in that uh, Surah Al Imran, I think it's 19, when Allah says, uh, you are, you know, the only, Religion, I have this now. Uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, Allah, Allah never, uh, Allah never addressed us as, as a, uh, actually, when he was addressing the Christian and, uh, Jews, he also said, Ya, you religion, Amanu, like in Surah in, in 62 and all that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is there any reason behind it that I don't understand or? I think uh, we have to understand that they were used synonymously. So the word Muslim and Mu'min, they are used synonymously in the Quran uh, to, to connote the fact that you are believers in God. So Iman and Taslim or Iman and Islam, they are used uh, synonymously in the same meaning. And there are instances in the Quran in which there, are, where is this, there is a strong insinuation for the word Muslim to be used uh, for believers as well. So, uh, 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 so when Allah, Allah addressed uh, Christians and and uh, Jews, uh, he's also calling them Muslim. You're saying that yes, they, 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 he's, they he's calling them Mumin. He's calling them Mumin. Actually, he's calling them Mumin. Yeah, because you see, they profess faith. So there were people who professed faith among the people of the book. This is this this you'll find in Surah Hadid that the word Amanu is being used for Jews and Christians because they believed in their own scriptures. So in that sense, they are called Mumin. So it's, 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 I mean, the Jews and the Christians. Uh, but I noticed that even, 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 um, Firaun when I was drowning, he, he said, I submit to the, you know, to the, uh, the your the Lord Mus of, uh, Lord of Musa, Musa and, Musa yeah. and, and Arun. Yeah. So, Musa but, Arun. Mm -hmm. so from what you're saying, we understand that Allah always called everybody Muslim then, right? When he's, when he's calling, 
Iman is expressing the inner form of Islam. So Islam is something which is the outer form of religion in which you profess faith, I mean, which you submit to God uh, through your deeds. And uh, Iman is your uh, internal, uh, is something that you believe internally. It's related to your own inner self. So your outer self is related uh, to what we call Islam. And that is why we say that when we submit to God through our deeds, we are called Muslim. So it's, it's a question of... Uh, being uh, related to each other in, in the way synonyms are. But as I said that the title given to the followers of, of prophets of God from Abraham was Muslim. So that is the name of the believers. I mean, it's like saying that your title is Muslim. You are people who submit to God. But when you are addressed as Mu'min, the word Mu'min is just telling you that you have faith in God. And as I said, if you look up the last paragraph of Surah Hadid, you'll find that the word Iman or Mu'min is also used for the Jews and Christians. Salaamu Dr. Shadal. Dr. Shadal, I want to know, okay, uh, Islam means um, um, Muslims are is every anybody who submits to God. So we are all Muslims, whether it's Christian or Jews. So in that respect, anybody who submits to God has a chance after death of if his deeds are good and he's be, led a good life of going to heaven. So it, we don't have to bracket them that only Muslims as Muslims as we understand will go to heaven, no, not Jews, not Christians, not uh, Buddhists, not anybody else. I just want a clarification on... I think we have, uh, yes, we have discussed this uh, a number of times that as far as salvation is concerned, it is not the monopoly of Muslims. Uh, there are certain objective standards which are given in the Quran for those uh, who would uh, end up in paradise. And one of those standards is that uh, they should not be guilty of intentionally denying a truth. So if the Jews and Christians, for example, who, uh, if they are not accepting Prophet Muhammad as the last prophet, uh, if they have some reason for that, which is justified, and they are not doing it deliberately, I mean justified to their own selves, and they are not doing it deliberately, intentionally, then yes, uh, uh, they could have a strong case for paradise. So you see, you need to uh, to reverse the question. It's not a, uh, the issue of uh, Muslims ending in paradise. It's, the, it's a question of certain objective criteria. And one of those criteria is that you are not guilty of any intentional denial of the truth. So if a Muslim is guilty, I mean Muslim by word I would say or by name, uh, followers of Muhammad are guilty, uh, uh, let me change my, my phrase here or my style here. So if a follower of Muhammad is, is guilty of, of denying a truth deliberately and if a follower of Moses or, or Jesus is also guilty of denying a truth deliberately, then they shall be treated in an equal way. And uh, there is no chance that they will end up in paradise because this is what the Quran tells us that intentional denial of the truth will, will really end people. Uh, or land people in, in hell. So what we need to understand is that uh, uh, profess faith in all realities which the Quran tells us, it has to be done positively. But only when you are uh, ex making an exception in the form of deliberate denial, then that is something which is not uh, acceptable to God. So then... Uh... So that's how people like Hindus who, who believe uh, obviously in shirk. But what about people like Buddhists and, or people in Africa who, whose religion one doesn't even know? If they need a good life and they haven't, uh, they haven't been exposed to the truth of the Quran or they haven't come near to learning about the Quran, what happens to them, these people in the world? They are so many, it's such a big world. What happens, what will happen to them? So the Quran has answered this question and has said that uh, the conception of God is something which is found in the intuition of every person. Yeah, I mean, a person cannot deny God any, as long as a person is accepting God and doing those righteous deeds. Uh, there is a case for him uh, to enter God's heaven. But if a person is, uh, in, is, is denying God, uh, which we find very few people doing, uh, they are believing in God without naming him or maybe giving him a new name. Uh, then that's a separate affair. But uh, other than that, the Quran says that if the guidance of the Prophet or the guidance of the Quran has not reached an individual, then he shall be held accountable on the basis of those universal 
uh, truths that are found in his own intuition, uh, what we call as universal goods, for example, uh, universal morality, uh, the fact that truth and uh, falsehood are clear in our own conscience. So the, con the, 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 the data that we have in our conscience uh, will be the data that uh, according to which we will be judged. Uh, of course, this is in parallel to the fact that uh, you cannot deny God. I mean, uh, denying God is something which the Quran is very vehement about, that this is something which is clearly found in a person's in intuition. And unless a person's intuition has got perverted uh, uh, or totally distorted, this, this cannot happen. So, yes, I've met Hindu friends in America everywhere who talk about God. And even when they write, it's amazing. They don't talk of their uh, gods, which they've made those statues. But they, when they talk of what they talk, oh, God, please make him well. God, please spare us uh, uh, misery. So they also talk of God. I know that. You see, this is... So, as, so as we know that Hindus themselves, they are not godless people. They believe in God. I mean, the thing is that they believe in several gods. And yes, uh, there are factions among them, like the Sanatan Dharma who are very close to monotheism and they, it does seem as if they are, uh, I mean, uh, except for Sanatana Dharma, it does seem that there are some who actually regard them uh, to be a supreme deity and then the rest of the deities are, I mean, they are just semi-gods or demigods who are supporting the, the, uh, the, the Bhagwan as they call the Ishwar. So it, it, there are a number of uh, sects within Hinduism. Uh, that, I mean, all, not all Hindus are the same, not all of them are mushriks, not all of them uh, conform to polytheism. And that is why I think we should treat Hinduism as a separate uh, subject. Uh, so there are branches of Hinduism in which there are the, the, the Trimurti, as they say, Vishnu, Krishna and Brahman, they, these are the three, uh, three gods, as they would say, is quite similar to, uh, to the trinity of the Christians. And then there are others who, who, who regard all the deities, all this, the rest of the deities to be, a, so, so, so to speak, an avatar or a manifestation of the Supreme God. So, as I said, that Christ, uh, Hinduism is not a monolithic religion. It doesn't, doesn't have the same beliefs all over. Uh, but what can be said uh, in summary is that the conception of a single God is found as per the Quran in Surah Araf, it says that this is something which is found in the fitrat or the nature of every single human being. And every single human being before he was sent to this earth, uh, there was a covenant which the Almighty took from the souls of every single human being uh, which was to be sent uh, in the world. And that was, Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And every single soul that was to to come on earth at that time was present and it said, yes, you are. So you see, uh, the Quran tells us that the conception of a soul deity is found in every single person's intuition and nature. Now, the question is that how those uh, intuitions and natures, they get perverted or distorted and what exactly, I mean, how far the, the Almighty will go in giving this judgment or maybe uh, maybe creating some excuse for them if they are, uh, I mean, if they have this excuse that, well, in spite of uh, this fact that, yes, it was God uh, who was present in their conception, but instead of recognizing him as God, they, they tilted towards some other superstition or something else came over them and they were overcome with other beliefs. So this is one area in which we have to let, deci uh, let God decide. Like uh, Shazab, like the Chinese, like the Russians. I mean, you look what in China. You can't think they believe in God. I don't know, and uh, and even the the Russians. These. these I think well, these you see, instead of going after people who I mean believe in God or not God, because you see, as I said, you will find religions like Confucianism, uh, like Taoism, who have no conception of God or any deity. They're, they're, they're all self-created or human-created religions. So they don't believe them to be divine, of divine origin. So Confucius, as we know, he was a Chinese philosopher who was given this status. Uh, similarly, if you go towards Shintoism or Taoism, these are religions or even Buddhism, uh, which, don't, uh, create, which don't have the deity uh, to be something that they call as divine, something that they have been communicated from a divine, uh, something beyond uh, their own senses. So their matter is absolutely different and they cannot be confused with, with divine religions. So if you have to classify religion, 
you must classify them as either divine or human, I mean, a product of human fancy or human uh, imagination. And we just cannot mix the two. So, I mean, the deeper we go, the more classification we can make, you will end up in this one single classification that either you claim them to be a divine religion, which is, of course, that God has, there is a supreme deity who has communicated himself to people on earth. And there is a second approach in which you are not relating yourself to any divine deity, but you are revering a divine pers a, a personality whom you think is giving you guidance. And they, they don't claim to have a hereafter. They don't think there is going to be a hereafter. So why do we go after settling their hereafter? So there are people who think that uh, accounts are settled in this world, the karma works, uh, we are reincarnated because of our own uh, bad or good deeds. So people who don't themselves stake any claim for the hereafter, we, I don't think we need to uh, make any judgment regarding them. So we just should leave it to God and only think about what, what we right. are. Means. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Slim. That was it for all of the questions. Okay, so let's start off with these uh, the translation as much as we can do in the remaining part so that uh, once again you have this practice of understanding the Quran directly from its text. So starting off with uh, verse 122, it says, uh, Ya Bani is O progeny, Israel. Is, are the Israels, so O progeny of Israel or O Israelites, Uzguru, Uzguru is remember, Ni'mati is my favor, Ni'ma is favor and Ni'mati when you have, you append that Ya to the word Ni'ma, it becomes my, my Ni'ma or my favor. So Uzguru Ni'mati, remember my favor, Allati that, An'amtu I did, Alaikum to you, Wa and Anni, I, fadaltukum, made you superior. Allah, upon, al alamin, all people of the world. So, idiomatically, the translation would be, O Israelites, recall my favor that I, that I had done upon you, and I had made you exalted, or I made you superior to all people of the world. So, you can note this thing here that the word wow here is for explication or for tafsir as we say in Arabic. So the wow is not used here as a, as a particle of conjunction in which you are actually relating two people uh, or two sentences or two clauses. This clause is actually an explanation of the previous clause. So when the Almighty says that I have done a favor to you, the next part is the explanation of that favor and that favor is that I have given you superiority over the rest of the world. So you see, the word vow here is not of conjunction. It is not adding two clauses together. It is not connecting two clauses. The word vow is actually explaining the previous clause. It is explaining the nema of God. What is that nema? That nema is or that favor is that the Almighty said that I am exalting you, I am making you superior to the rest of the world. And we know that when God speaks in these terms, he means that the Israelites were made responsible uh, for, the, for the delivery of the truth to other nations. So this was the, uh, this was the fuzzle or this was the nirma which was given to them. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمَ اللَّا تَجْزِي نَفْسٌ عَنْ نَفْسٍ وَا and So here wow is classically in the same meaning as and. So you have to note that the word wow has several meanings. One of them is, of course, uh, as you see, it's, uh, it's a conjunction. It is a clause uh, in which you are uh, juxtapos juxtaposing two, two uh, clauses which are adjacent. Similarly, the word wow is also used for tafsir. It is also used uh, for an oath. And this is an example that is coming up in later verses. But wattaku and ittaku fear. Yawman, the day. La, not. Tajzi, benefit, nafsun, a soul, an, in lieu of, nafsin, another soul, shay'an, even a little. So, idiomatically it would be, fear the day in which no soul will be of any benefit to another soul. Nafsun, an nafsin, nafsun, an nafsin, shay'a, even a little bit. Wa and la, not. Yuqbalu, shall be accepted. Minha, from it, so referring to the soul. Minha is minan nafs. Adlun, adlun would mean uh, any compensation, any any remuneration. Wa 
and la not tanfa'uha will be of benefit to it shafa'a intercession wa and la not hum they yunsarun helped so idiomatically we can say that you fear that day in which no soul will be of the slightest benefit to another soul and no remuneration no compensation will be accepted for it wala tanfa'uha shafa'atun nor will any intercession be of any benefit to it to it means to the soul wala hum yunsarun and neither will they be helped and neither will these people be helped wa izibtala ibrahim rabbuhu bi kalimatin fa atammahunna wa is again the same meaning and so this is the most common meaning of the word wa it it occurs in this meaning so frequent in the quran that people they mistakenly uh, ascribe this meaning everywhere so it's a word of caution the more it is common the more you have to be careful because it's not used always in the same meaning wa and is when ibtala ibtala means to test ibrahima Ib- abraham rabbuhu his lord bi kalimatin by a few things the word kalimat is the plural of kalima fa atammahunna so therefore he fulfilled them one thing that you can note in the text of the quran is are the spellings of the word ibrahim so you see you'll find the word ibrahim being spelled the way it is spelled here and you'll also find Abra- uh, the word abraham in arabic being spelled with a ya after ha so you'll also find it being written as ibrahim so it's written as ibrahim and ibrahim so these are both uh, spellings of uh, abraham in the arabic language so don't get confused if you find a ya with ha at other instances and as you can see here you don't find that ha so ibrahim is the is the pronunciation here qala he said inni so qala is mean is actually referring to god god said inni uh, i ja'iluka make you ja'iluka make you the ka is is uh, for you linnasi for the people imama leader so god said i am going to make you the leader of mankind ja'iluka linnasi imama qala wa min zurriyati qala is now abraham so this is how something you'll find this switching occurring in arabic and in a dialogue very frequently qala and qala so at once you find the qala is from god god said and in reply abraham said what did he say wa and min about zurriyati my children so he said what about my children so the question is that you are making me the leader of mankind so will my children also have this uh, this authority or this this position of leadership now god says qala la no yanalo reach ahdi my commitment my promise azalimin to the unjust so it means that my promise does not reach the unjust so in other words the the, the question is very brief and the answer is even more brief so the the question was what about my progeny and the almighty said well uh, amongst your progeny those who would be unjust my promise will not be fulfilled for them which actually means that there would be some other people who would be just and for them god's promise would exist but this is the beauty of the arabic language you have this brevity this brevity in which what is understood is left out so the, the almighty did not say that there would be people who would be good as well he only said that as far as the evil people are concerned they will not get this promise from me fulfilled for themselves wa and is when ja'alna we made al baita the house mathabatal linnas a place linnas for people wa and amna a place of peace and so that masaba linnas is just a uh, just a place of re- residence and amna is a place where there is peace what takhizu and ittakhizu hold min from maqam place ibrahim abraham musalla a prayer place so it means that you make a prayer place in the land of abraham so maqam abraham is basically referring to the land of mecca 
So it is being told that in this land of Mecca, you make a prayer place. Musalla, as you know, is a place where you pray. Is a place where you pray. Wa ahidna ila Ibrahima wa Ismaila. So you see, you can you can see in the word Ismail, the ya is always there. You will never find the pronunciation to be Ismail. It wherever it is mentioned in the Quran, it is Ismail. But Abraham, where he is mentioned with both these pronunciations, Ibrahim and Ibrahim. So wa ahidna ila Ibrahima wa Ismaila would mean, and we bound. Abraham and Ishmael and what did we bound them by or what promise did we make them binding upon and that is un that tahira they shall both cleanse or clean baitia my house lit taifina for those who do tawaf so taifin is the plural uh, signifying the those who do tawaf wa and <coughs> al aqifina those who do itqaf Wa and Rukka. So Rukka is the plural of Raqe and Raqe is those who kneel. Us-Sujood, who prostrate, who kneel and who, those who prostrate. So idiomatically we can translate this as and we made Abraham and Ismail fulfill this promise. We bound them to make this promise come true. And what was that? That they were required to keep my house clean for those who who are going to do tawaf and for those who are going to do etakaf and for those who are going to kneel and for those who are going to prostrate. And I think I did clarify this that the word tahira is not referring to that physical cleanliness of cleaning the house with water and with or, or cleansing it from dust. It is actually referring to that spiritual part in which it has to be kept uh, cleansed from any polytheism. So if you find, if you, if you read the Quran, for example, you, you, you know this uh, from Surah Tawbah that, uh, that shirk or polytheism is called najis. It is something which is unclean and spiritual uncleanliness is referred to as najis. So in a very similar way here, you'll find that uh, Abraham and Ishmael are being told that as far as the house of God is concerned, you should not contaminate it with any filth of polytheism. With any filth. So word filth is actually the opposite of tahira. And here it is referring to that spiritual uh, disbelief of polytheism. Wa is, and then it, the next verse is, Wa is qala Ibrahima, Ibrahimu rabbi ja'al haza baladan amina. Wa and is when qala said, Ibrahim, Abraham, rabbi, O Lord, ij'al, make haza this baladan city, aminan, a secure one. Wa and Urzuk uh, provide it with uh, provide it with sustenance and provide uh, Urzuk Ahlahu would mean provide its people with sustenance. So Ahl is those who inhabit that city and who is referring is a pronoun referring to that city. Uh, so idiomatically we can translate it as and recall when Abraham said, O Lord, make this city a land of peace. And urzuk ahlahu bin samarat and give sustenance to its people from various produce. Uh, I think I did clarify this that in Arabic language the word samarat is not always used for fruits. So all kinds of produce, including agricultural products, including fruits, they are called samar or uh, their plural is samarat in the Arabic language. So Abraham is praying that this barren land, this land in which uh, there was no water you grant this land to be a place where people are provide sustenance and then it is said man amana minhum billahi do provide this sustenance to those who believe in god man those amana believe minhum from among them billah in god so abraham is said you provide sustenance to only those people who believe in god wal yawmil akhir and the last day al yawm is day akhir is the last Qala, God said, Woman kafara, and they who commit disbelief, wa and man who kafara disbelieved, fa umatti'uhu, I shall make them benefit. Kalilan, a little. Thumma, then, azdar ruhu, drag them. 
ela two words azab punishment an nar hell wa and bi'sa very evil masir a place so uh, idiomatically the translation would be the, this the speaker of the word qala is god so god is replying remember the prayer of abraham was that this city of uh, mecca make this a place of sustenance make this a place for peace only for those who believe in god in the last day but god replied differently he said i am going to provide even those who disbelieve not just who are believing even those who disbelieve qala wa man kafara fa umattihu kalila those who disbelieve i am going to make them benefit a little i mean saying that as far as this world is concerned my favor is not going to be confined just to the believers i am going to give this sustenance and this peaceful atmosphere of the city to the disbelievers as well but this will be for a while this will be just for this world thumma then azdar ruhu i shall drag them ila towards azabin nar the fire the punishment of the fire wa bi'sal masir and it is a very evil abode wa bi'sal masir bi'sa is bad masir is a place that you live in so referring to hell that it is a very very evil place to live in wa and is remember yarfa'u uh, because the word is uh, the verb is used with the word foundation so you can say it's basically yarfa'u al-qawaida so qawaida is the plural of qaida and qaida is foundation so the translation with abraham as the subject of this word would be and remember when abraham was raising the foundations min al-bayt of the house wa ismail together with ismail so remember when abraham and ismail both were building the house of god and what did they say at that time rabbana taqabbal minna rabbana o oh our lord taqabbal please accept minna from us god or lord please accept from us which means that we are building this house for you please accept this from us innaka innaka is indeed you the ka is a pronoun for the addresser which means i mean which is referring to god here so it is said that oh god innaka oh god, in, indeed you anta is again something which is stressing uh, uh, the the addresser which is you asmi is listener one who hears al alim one who is knowledgeable so it is said innaka anta samiul alim indeed god you are the one who hears and who are, who is knowledgeable so basically this is uh, the prayer uh, which is being made by abraham and uh, and this this invocation that god please accept this prayer and what is that prayer we are now approaching that prayer rabbana waj'alna muslimain laka so rabbana our lord wa and ja'alna make us muslimain lak submitting to you so muslimain is basically a dual this is something that occurs in arabic so in normal in, in languages that we are generally used to we have a singular and we have a plural but in the arabic language there is also a third uh the third form of addresser and that is you also have a dual which means you are addressing two entities or two uh, particular objects in this case two addresses so that is muslimain laka referring to the fact god make us any make us make me and ismail make ourselves wa min zurriyatina and from among our progeny what ummatan a nation muslimatan submissive laka to you so the the prayer is lord make us submissive submissive to you this is the first part make both of us me i mean the the, the prayer is because uh, is from both the father and the son signifying the fact that make both of us submissive to you and raise a community an umma which is also submissive to you and then it says wa arena wa and arena show us manasikana the ways of worship manasik is the plural of mansak so manasik is the plural of mansak manasikana would be our ways of worship wa and tub alaina have mercy on us innaka indeed you anta is again just stressing the previous ka as 
indeed you. At-Tawwab. At-Tawwab means highly forgiving. Ar-Rahim, merciful. So idiomatically, the translation would be, And Lord, make both of us submissive to you and make from our descendants. The word Ij'alna is repeated. Ij'al zurriyatana. So make our progeny, make from among our progeny a community that is submissive to you. And show us the ways of worship. Show us, show us our ways of worship. Wa and, and, and have mercy on us. Indeed, you are merciful and you are ever forgiving. So I'm going to stop here because in time, uh, time is also finished. Uh, the remaining uh, literal translation, inshallah, we'll do next week and also start off uh, with the next uh, set of verses. And until then, it is uh, Khuda Hafiz and uh, Assalamu Alaikum.